Hello everyone, Mike with Spray Jones, and we're going to go over why sprayed polyurethane foam is safe and effective. And I'm going to chop it into two segments uh, in this one video. First, going over why it's safe, and then secondly, why it's effective. So, something you need to know right out the bat, if you don't want to watch any more of this video than the first minute, is there is rated foam and non-rated foam. Now, when I speak from the standpoint of rated foam, what I mean is foam that is going into buildings, buildings, houses, uh, commercial buildings, institutional buildings, buildings that follow under, under the building code and have an architect and an engineer overseeing them, that spray foam, whether you're in the U.S. or in Canada, is going to have some sort of a pedigree to it. It's going to have testing, certification, it's going to have ASTM standards, ULC standards, and in Canada it's going to have a CCMC number, which just is a fancy way of saying it's certified to go into, into buildings where the building code has jurisdiction. If you are not, if you're doing agricultural buildings, you're doing uh, pig barns, you're doing uh, silos, you're doing oil and gas work, you're doing mining work, industrial work, that material doesn't necessarily need to be rated and it shouldn't be used in residences or buildings where people are going to be occupying them. So the first thing out of the gate is to make sure that you are dealing with a rated certified material that has its testing and its pedigree. Otherwise you have no idea about the very points that I'm going to start making. All right, point number one is going to be uh, flame spread smoke development. So we're going to for the purposes of this discussion, we're just going to stick with the Canadian information because in many cases the Canadian information is far more thorough than anything that you're going to find in the U.S. And that's just because the U.S. doesn't have a nationalized building code in the sense that you can tell California or New York or Texas the same thing. Like there, there's, It's state and county and individual states will have regulations. So you have to check with your state, your county, your area as to what's going to be certified and what isn't. So in Canada, we test here, I've got the cursor over flame spread classification. Now this is a pass fail. Anything under 500, the flame spread rating is a pass. We don't have class one, class two, class three. So it is tested for flame spread and it's tested to a unified Canadian Underwriters Laboratory of Canada standards. So this isn't something that the supplier has come up with or we have come up with. This is a nationalized standard for testing of flame spread of all products, whether it's plastic or a, a wood countertop or wood flooring or even gypsum board. You are going to test the flame spread ratings to this nationalized standard and it's a pass fail. So in Canada, it, it passes with actually flying colors. Uh, the Smoke development is part of that. It's in the rating. Uh, you get one number that deals with everything, and if you don't pass, then the product isn't going to be certified for sale. The second thing that we're going to go to is off-gas testing. Um, this is major, and this is something that the U.S. massively lags behind. And time to reoccupancy here, 24 hours to a CAN ULC standard S774. So this is dealing with how much gas is coming out of the foam? Uh, is it going to be safe to be around? And the reoccupancy rating is 24, so that means after I've sprayed it, they are z picking up zero volatile organic compounds within the 24-hour rating. And I'll show you something else here. Okay, so this is switching over to the brochure. Um, they have a whole section here. Does it improve occupant comfort, health, and safety? Um, Draft-free, airtight building envelope prevents infiltration of Pollutants, toxins, and allergens. It also helps prevent the growth of mold, fungi, and that's done to an ASTM test too. Um, controlled by the movement of moisture and vapor through the building envelope, helping it to eliminate condensing surfaces. Testing has proven the wall tight does not off-gas any harmful toxins, VOCs, volatile organic compounds after installation of indoor air quality is safe within 24 hours for reoccupancy after the application of foam. So again, all certified and tested. Your flame spread, your smoke development, your off-gassing, going back to the other sheet, fungi growth, right here at the bottom, after 28 day incubation, no fungi, fungal growth exhibited, again, done to an ASTM C1338 standard. Please understand that when you have ASTM and CAN ULC standards, this is as good as it gets. These are industry standards across the board that all products are going to be certified to. And it's not just something that anybody can come up with. It's a nationalized standard.
Uh, fourth point, um, hot surface performance right here. Uh, passed when exposed to 93 degrees Celsius for 96 hours. What is that talking about? Um, we're supposed to be keeping the foam away from heat emitting devices, but it is showing you that the foam can withstand up to 93 degrees Celsius for 96 hours, and it's just going to be burn and char. It's not going to be... Um, it's not going to be actually melting and dripping or doing anything like that. This is a thermal plastic. It's a thermal set. And as a result, uh, it doesn't revert back into a liquid state. So you've got hot surface performance, fungi growth, flame spread classification. The next is going to be recycled content. Okay, so here we go at the top. Uh, recycled content, yes, uh, they're going to be using... Uh, all sorts of different post-industrial recycled material in its process. Now, before you get all too greeny on me about this, recycled content is great to have, and I suppose it's a good way to use it up. But it makes, in the long run, if you have a lot of recycled content, it can make for a very poor polyol. And I've, I've told other people that have chimed in, we're not actually choosing this product for much more than longevity nobody's interested in can i grind it up 10 years and reuse it someplace else they want to know if this is going to be lasting 100 200 years and that's that's what we're looking for the other thing is bio-based renewable content so bsf made a decision a long time ago i'm just going to scroll down here that uh, they would not be putting in anything that is of an edible food crop so here you're going to see that they used bio-based polyols from renewable resources and that they use castor oil they're not going to be using soy oil so soybean oil um, it is important that they use non edible oil seed crop and that they are not depleting the natural wealth so you you don't use cropland to create polyols for plastics when that cropland can be used to create food to feed people and the nation and continents you understand so there's a big craze, there was a big craze on using ethanol or using uh, soy-based products to have polyols. And the issue is that it doesn't make sense from a life cycle standpoint uh, if you're going to be starving people out just to make plastic, right? Moving on further, uh, this is an ever-changing uh, product. Uh, the environmental protection agencies, the Montreal Protocols, zero ozone depleting substances that means we're constantly having to change the blowing agent which is forms the cellular structure in the foam that's what gives the foam its insulating value is the blowing agent inside the cells but we have been using a zero ozone depleting blowing agent uh, since uh, 2010 and then here in 2020 we're going to be making another change again which is going to get even more don't ask me all of the the very complicated chemistry questions as to why they have to do it again other than they're going to be going down a notch again in what's contributing to um, environmental impact so that's another process with BSF is that they look for total environmental impact not just one aspect of the product they want to know cradle to the grave is it continuous uh, on improvement are they able to phase out one product or chemistry component for something newer and better and the answer is absolutely yes and they're not just wanting to say one thing makes for everything so wh what am I saying is that when you take a look it would be foolish to use and expend more energy in creating your product than your product is ever capable of saving right that would put you in a net zero situation so you want to make sure that the product itself is going to be total in its cradle to grave assessment of what it's going to cost to make it for energy and the amount of energy that it's going to save and then the third or the final thing is third-party verification all of this means nothing if the suppliers can slap a label on it and just say whatever they want uh, are they having some sort of third-party testing? I've already talked to you about ASTM, can ULC, uh, but when it comes to getting like an eco logo certification, uh, it all has to be third-party criteria and match 
their requirements and make sure that your product doesn't have something in it. Like you could have something that's really, really environmentally friendly on one side, but then you could have a toxic catalyst on the other side. So they need to take a look at the total chemistry that's going into the product and ensure that there's nothing from one end to the next. And Eco Logo certification is very difficult to get. Uh, when I spoke to some of the head people at BASF about it, they told me that they weren't going to get it certified. And uh, the reason being was that they were required to reveal all of their trade secrets as to what they were doing, how they were doing it. They needed the recipe. They needed the entire formula. And some executives at BASF said, absolutely no way. It's a trade secret. It's corporate uh, proprietary knowledge. And they weren't going to do it. And then they finally decided that, that they should, that they would protect the trade secrets and that there was more to gain in proving that the product could manage and achieve the eco logo certification uh, and that they'd lose more without it than they would by giving up what was in it. Moving along into effectiveness of spray polyurethane foam, does it have design limitations? Uh, no, it does not. Uh, and this is probably my favorite selling point of the spray foam is if you're dealing with panelized products, you're dealing with something that is pre-made in a factory and then shipped to you at job site, you're capped with what they can make, how they can make it, and how it's going to fit into your design. And then fitting it uh, and all the limitations that you might encounter on site. But when it comes to spray foam, you can hire any framer, any building erector, any masonry contractor to construct what you're going to want in your state, county, province, country. And then you can bring in your spray foam contractor and foam and seal the whole thing up. So you can build it out of wood. You can have a total wood frame construction on a commercial building, residential building. You can do a vaulted ceiling, do any kind of wall combination that you want. You can spray it in or out. You can do poured concrete. Uh, out of a form spray foam it inside and out uh, you can do tilt up precast panels precast concrete in the ground above ground spray foam it you can do steel metal building put up the shell multi multi-tier buildings um, cantilever overhangs you name it just about anything steel stud and uh, exterior dens glass or uh, exterior grade drywall Masonry cavity, cavity walls, uh, such as cinder block or a brick tie with a hollow, hollow cavity in between and the spray foam to the outside. Just about any single thing that you can make. For goodness sakes, the space shuttle, liquid oxygen tank, one, one and a half inches of spray foam on there, shaped with like a bullet, goes into outer space. That's polyurethane foam. So there are no design limitations. And improved energy efficiency, that's our second point. Yeah. You're dealing with a spray applied seamless system that requires no fasteners and it doesn't lose its insulating performance. So the, the foam is all rated to um, long term thermal resistant values, which we're going to get into. But the next point that I want to make is structural strength. Structural strengthening of the foam is, is massive. I mean, uh, the, the stats are all there on the foam in a 2x4 wall, 2x6 wall, double sheeted, single sheeted. I've actually got a video that you can watch on structural strength and how it improves it. So I'm not going to go into this here. But I have found uh, ready to move home builder that we eliminated the plywood on the inside of the house on a 2x6 wall. They would normally sheet it to the outside, batten poly it, then 3 8 sheet it on the inside and then put the drywall on. Then the, the 3 8 on the interior was to eliminate as much cracking as possible. We got them to eliminate all of that plywood and just use the spray foam. And we sprayed the roofs, uh, non-vented, and we sprayed the walls. And those buildings were so solid that how they were sitting in the yard was exactly how they were sitting when they got delivered to the site. So there was no twisting, there was no moving, and there was no... If the building wasn't perfectly level in the yard, it wasn't going to be perfectly level when it got to site because it was going to hold that shape permanently and they were quite amazed at it uh, going back to this physical properties chart water absorption is another longevity point I mean ha half just a little over half of a percent by volume of water absorption in its life span I mean 
that's because of the six uh, percent open cell content now, I have found that the spray foam uh, closed cell it is certified to go in the ground it is certified to be on exterior of buildings both you know, in ground and above but I found as long as it's not sitting in a hundred percent saturation point all the time it's not going to become waterlogged so if you want to use it as dock flotation then it better have an additional waterproofing layer around it uh, some type of a skin but under normal conditions where there's going to be a wet cycle and then a drying cycle and that there's an actual drainage plane meaning the water has got somewhere to go a uh, high high concentration to low concentration or running downhill then the spray foam isn't going to become uh, waterlogged at all and therefore water absorption is a huge part of building degradation uh, roof uh, rot and siding rot and the walls rotting it's all going to be damp uh, water's gotten in and water is absorbed and water can't come back out and the spray foam is going to stop that in its tracks I alluded to this a little bit uh, earlier LTTR long-term thermal resistance value L T T R uh, you try and find fiberglass or other panel products that are going to be rated out to 30 years it's very difficult if not impossible in certain situations to do it spray foam is required we are not advertising our insulating values based on today's installation values we're we're showing you a 30 year pro rated value and and to all of you people that have chimed in in the last little while that have said well you know this product hasn't proven itself um I want to sit there and see 20 years from now 30 years from now how it's going to be well that's that's insanity I it's very egotistical to sit there and say that you need to wait for something 30 and 40 years to see how it's going to perform nothing would ever get built in life think about this banking and insurance industry which rules the world is ready to give a mortgage or insurance policy with spray foam installations based on this kind of criteria and data they have prorated it and seen that the foam is going to last the longevity of the 30-year mortgage the 25-year mortgage or the liability of the insurance so there is no need to sit there and say that you gotta wait 40 years to see how the foam is going to perform when the testing has already been done such that they're able to satisfy the insurance and the mortgage underwriters that they will write a mortgage for 30 years and know that after 10 years it isn't going to go bad or be obsolete or outdated technology or, or have to be removed because something has been found about it this is this is a very serious subject and that's why we have LTTRs long-term thermal resistant values rated out to the entire lifespan of what the insurance and mortgage industry is willing to write it for which is the 30-year cycle all right these are killing two birds with one stone adhesion tests uh, to the substrate uh, scroll over to the right here yeah three different over different substrates the adhesion results are the foam is certified over wood and rock and plastic and glass and metal and just about every single building material that you can decide to build with it's been tested and certified we have adhesion of the substrate minimum pull standards that it takes to, to pull and release the product off and then adhesion co-adhesion which is the product sticking to itself so that leads into section number two uh, where I'm at on the next section here of air barrier testing results because I'll get a lot of people that'll sit there and say well okay fine the foam is fine now but what what about two or three years from now isn't that stuff crack and peel away from the studs no it, it is not if you're having an adhesion issue you have a substrate issue you have a chemical issue um, there needs to be further investigation as to what exactly has been going on but this product is certified and tested to be an air barrier material which means it's not going to work very well if in three years time the the product is cracked delaminating and not sealing the product the the, the building up very well so it has to have uh, an air barrier rating and it has to have an adhesion test which it does on rated materials the uh, final point on effectiveness that I would make for the foam is uh, expansion the filling of the gaps uh, 
if the foam was just like a truck box coating and sprayed and just stuck to the wall and didn't froth up, didn't foam up, then it wouldn't expand in all the cracks and all the crevices. And that is a huge, huge selling point and a necessary component of what we're bringing here because the spray foam is going to push into the corners. It's going to push into the substrate. It's working upwards as well as working backwards. And you need to be able to see that pushing into blind corners and around edges and up is a major part of why we want foam in the first place. Otherwise, if we just had to spray on a liquid that was going to be your insulation, but it didn't rise and set and didn't push in and expand, it wouldn't fill the gap. It wouldn't fill the spaces. It wouldn't get into where we need it to be. And we'd be stuck trying to work a liquid applied product like paint into blind corners and difficult areas and around edges and stuff like that. So the actual rising of the foam contributes a lot to its adhesion because it's pushing into all these cracks and crevices and filling the voids. And I think at the the very end of the building product process, this is why you want to choose this because every other product doesn't expand. Only a liquid applied foam is going to expand into the cracks. Whether you're buying a sheet product, a panel product, a pre-insulated product, you now have to cut it, form it, and get it to fit and get it to be sealed up. Whereas the foam, again, back to your design, no design limitations, you build it, you create it, bring in the spray foam guy, and they're going to make it and should be able to get it sealed up. So there you go. There are your effectiveness and your safety on why spray foam is safe and effective to use. I know this is a longer video, but there's a lot of information to go over here and we'd be doing a disservice to something if we left out uh, any one of these points. So have a good day, be blessed, click like, subscribe and share and comment on the video. Thank you.